So uh, just to read our title out of verse number three, we've gone through the first four verses of this chapter, but three has our title, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. For the last several weeks we've considered that. What is it to be a good soldier of Jesus Christ? And we saw three specific things in this particular chapter here. Uh, that first of all, uh, coming out of verse number two, uh, train those soldiers, train soldiers that will train other soldiers that will train other soldiers. Uh, number two, we saw that there is a calling in verse three to endure hardness, to endure hardship as a good soldier. And then fourthly, uh, to attend to our orders without distraction. Don't be entangled with the affairs of this life. We saw that in verse four. The motivation behind it all is so that we might please him who has chosen us to be a soldier at the end of verse number four. So we, con we considered those three topics, and I want to read a verse uh, that we closed with last week and re refresh your memory just quickly uh, in what our fourth point was. In 1 Peter chapter number two, 1 Peter chapter number two, we saw that part of the calling of the soldier. And, and we've been comparing these things to what we see in the natural realm concerning soldiers. The, reasons, the reason that soldiering works like it does is because God invented that to be a type of what the experience would be for the believer, for the spiritual soldier. And so we saw last week uh, in 1 Peter 2 and in verse number 17, honor all men and do what? Love the brotherhood. Love the brotherhood. Fear God, honor the king. So we focused on that last week, love the brotherhood. And we talked about the brotherhood among soldiers, this band of brothers and how there was a unique relationship between them. And God has called the soldier to love the brethren, the soldier of Christ to love the brethren. So we spent time on that last week. Well, this week, I want to focus on a thought that's at the beginning of that verse. All right. And what, what's the first three words? Actually, only two because the third word's added by the translators. But go ahead and read the first three ver words again of that verse. Honor all, Honor all men. The Lord has called his spiritual soldiers to honor all men. Go to Luke chapter number three. Luke chapter 3, we've also read this verse in our study. And this was the instruct, instruction from John the Baptist when, you know, different people groups were coming to him and saying, you know, in different professions, different activities, what should we do? And, and he was given instruction as the Spirit of God led. And here you had soldiers coming to him and said, well, what about us? What, what would you have us do? And so uh, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, this was the instruction that John the Baptist gave the soldiers in Luke 3 and in verse number 14. And what we focused on when we first read this was the last phrase. And so God has taken us back to some of the passages we've already read and said, I want you to pick up some things here. And, and so we're going to look at the first two phrases uh, this morning. But in verse number 14, it says, And the soldiers likewise demanded of him, saying, And what shall we do? And, and just... To stop and think about this for a minute, when you talk about a soldier in Christ's day, you're not just talking about soldiering like we tend to think about it today where someone's you know, sent off to fight, you know, uh, to serve somewhere overseas, to, uh, you know, the, in, uh, in some sort of fort or something. You know, it's not simply that. This was the police force in their day as well, right? I mean, the, the soldiers were there among the people to main, pe maintain peace among the people. So there was a very active presence uh, maybe more so than we kind of think about soldiering today, but that was also a role uh, that they played. And so, and we see that today. We still see where soldiers are called in to kind of enhance the police force at certain times. But it, what, what would you have us do, they demanded of John. And, and he said unto them, do violence to no man. How many men? No men. Uh, behave this way towards all men, neither accuse any falsely, and then be content with your wages. Like I said, first time we focused on the contentment that they should have as they endured hardness well, as we looked at our second point. But I want to consider the first part of this verse this morning, and I want to make this fifth point concerning spiritual soldiers. Soldiers have a sense of duty towards those that are outside towards them that are without, as it says in some scriptures. In other words, it, they have a, a sense of responsibility to the ones that aren't part of the armed forces, right? A sense of duty to those that exist outside of that. And Christian, God's called us to that as well. 
We, we see that pattern here. We saw it in that verse that we just read. Before he said love the brotherhood, he said, listen, you need to honor who? Everybody, right? There needs to be a sense of responsibility, a sense of duty that you feel towards everybody, not just those that are among the church. Yes, we are to especially do good to those that are of the faith, but what does the beginning of that verse say? As you have, therefore, opportunity, do good to everybody, right? All, a sense of duty and responsibility to all, and then especially to those that are of the household of faith. Definitely the language like we emphasized last week is different. Honor all men, and then there's a special love for the brotherhood. But don't throw away the beginning where we are called to honor all men. A sense of duty unto all. Do good to all. Look at Romans 13 and verse number 8. Romans 13, verse number 8. And I want, you to, I want you to go here and then stick your finger there and flip over an, another page or two um, and just get ready to go to Romans 15, verse 27. We're going to read 13, 8 first, but we're going to go immediately to Romans 15, 27 because I want you to see this Greek word in 13, 8. All right, so just the beginning. Don't read any further. Just the first phrase in Romans 13, 8. What does it say? Owe no man anything, all right? I want to show you that word O oh, right there, that Greek word. Go to Romans 15 and verse 27 and show you what that word is talking about. Um, 26, for it's pleased them of Macedonia and Achaia to make a certain contribution for the poor saints which are at Jerusalem. And it hath pleased them verily, verse 27, and their debtors they are. Listen to this now. For if the Gentiles have been made partakers of their spiritual things... Next three words. Their duty, is. their duty is. Then, therefore, if they've been partaker of the spiritual things, they have a duty towards these individuals. Their duty, then, is their response. In other words, they're bound to behave a certain way towards these individuals. Their duty is also to minister unto them in carnal things. It ought to be that way, the Lord says. All right? So now, their duty is, that is the same Greek word, O. Oh, at, in Romans 13, verse number 8, all right? So it has to do with having a sense of responsibility, a sense of duty. Uh, the, uh, you're bound, you're under bondage in this particular way. And so the beginning of the verse says, Owe no man anything. Don't put yourself in bondage to men in any way, except there is one thing that you owe every man. And what does it say? Owe no man anything but to love one another. You do have that duty, right? You do have that responsibility to men in general. That is something that we owe our fellow man in and outside of the church. Owe no man anything but to love one another. For he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. And then he starts breaking some things down, uh, you know, naming some verses out of the law. For this, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other command, uh, commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. The word neighbor here is a term broader than just your fellow brethren in the church. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. How are you, church, going to properly relate to everyone? Simple. Love, right? The one thing you owe all men is to love. The one thing that is your duty to do to all men is to love them, right? You owe them love. Why? Why is it that why do we have why should we have this sense of duty to mankind in general? Well, look at uh, Genesis chapter number nine. Let's go back to the beginning. Genesis chapter number nine. And this this is the beginning of this this world that we're in right now. You know, we're not in the same world that was here to start with. What was it? Peter writes about that, how people are willingly ignorant of the fact that, you know, when they talk about all things have continued just like it has from the beginning, since the fathers fell asleep, it's always been the same way. And he's like, uh, no, the world that used to be, God destroyed all that with a flood, right? 
And so now we've got this next world uh, that, that the Lord set forth after he had cleansed that old. And he gives some instruction uh, to Noah. And one of the things that he says is, is that, there, that murder is a crime, is an offense that should require the death penalty. That's what he sets forth here in this particular text. Uh, in, in verse number 5, it's required of every beast. Surely your blood, the blood of your lives will I require. At the hand of every beast will I require it. And at the hand of man, at the hand of every man's brother will I require the life of man. Whoso sheddeth man's blood by man shall his blood be shed. Why? Why is, it, why is there a distinction between mankind and the rest of creation? For in the image of God, what? made he man some people use the phrase man is God's image bearer God made man in his image and so God sets a unique value on the life of man here because man was made in the image of God we ought to have a unique responsibility of man, toward man that exceeds responsibility towards animals a lot of people get that backwards today there's plenty of accounts in the scripture, though, where, you know, uh, 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 doesn't God care for the sparrow? Guess what? You're worth many sparrows, right? Uh, 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 you know, uh, I, I, I uh, just read the other day where God takes the demons out of the man that has thousands of them in, them, in him. And what was the result? 200 pigs died, right? There was a value uh, more upon this man that was a living soul. In fact, Jesus Christ crossed over the Sea of Galilee just to save this one guy, just to rescue this one man and set him free. And then he turned around and he went back. So there's a value placed upon the life of a man that exceeds that of the rest of creation. Why? Because man is made in the image of God. If for no other reason than just that, right? We ought to value men and there ought to be that sense of which, a sense of duty towards all men because men bear the image of God. God put a value upon the life of man than the rest of creation. But go to Colossians 4. I want you to see something else. Colossians chapter number 4. A sense of duty because man is made in God's image. Colossians chapter 4. Colossians chapter 4 and verse number 5. Walk in wisdom toward them what? That are without. Who's he talking about? Outside the church. He's talking about the lost, right? There's a sense of responsibility that we need to have towards those that are without. There's a wisdom that we ought to exercise as we walk before those that are without. Uh, verse number five, uh, redeeming the time. Another verse says, why? Because the days are evil. Because we realize that the time is short. Because we realize that there, there's not infinite time when it comes to this. That man is made in the image of God. And something that we know about man is that his life is going to expire. Man is going to stand before God in judgment. And that ought to give us a sense of urgency, Christian. To walk in wisdom towards them that are without and making sure that your speech is always with what? With grace. Verse 7. I mean verse 6. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you might know how you ought to answer every man. You ought to have salt in the way that you speak. What good is salt if it's lost its savor, right? Right? There ought to be salty speech. I still remember uh, Brother Bob bringing that lesson that time, talking about that the Word of God ought to, ought to give people, uh, uh, it, th there ought to be a saltiness to it so, it so it draws them to want to drink, right? And the parallel between the Spirit of God and the, the, that, that drinking that water, asking the Savior for that water, water will buy it, whereby they will never thirst again. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you might know how you ought to answer every man. Listen, this is what Jesus Christ Christ did. What he's telling us to do here is exactly the thing that they said was true of Christ. Do you remember that? When Jesus opened up the book and he began to read and, and he said, you know, this day this scripture is fulfilled in your ears and he, and he began to talk, to preach on all these things and they were like, they, they wondered, it says, at the gracious words that he spoke. 
He had speech that was gracious speech. And we know they were offended in him. You know, the unbeliever will use any excuse to not believe the truth, right? Well, this is, but this is Joseph's son, right? This is Mary. We know his brothers and his sisters. But the thing that he did is he preached the word of God and he had grace upon his lips. He spoke gracious words seasoned with salt. There was a sense of care for those that he spoke to. He walks up to a woman that's walking along and and he's moved with compassion because he sees that her only son has died and he goes and he raises the boy. Nobody asked him to do that. It was just compassion that he felt in his heart towards her and her situation. He came in the likeness of sinful flesh to to experience life as us, to be tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. He shared these gracious words with men. He set a pattern for us. Walk in wisdom towards those that are without. Paul said in Romans 10.1, he said, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel. And what Israel is he talking about? He's talking about his kinsmen according to the flesh, right? My heart's desire and prayer for Israel is that they might be saved. Paul had a sense of duty towards those that were without. As big as his heart was for the church. And we saw that. We saw last week his his relationship with Epaphroditus. And and Epaphroditus' relationship with him. And the same thing with Timothy. And that, that unique brotherhood among these fellow soldiers. Still though, his heart was not just upon the church. He had a heart to, to call men into the church right from everywhere. My heart's desire, my prayer for Israel is that they might be. I'm praying to God concerning that. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4. First Thessalonians chapter number 4. Look at what it says here concerning the reason that we ought to work hard and live honestly in this present age. One of the reasons that we do that is out of a sense of duty towards the lost around us. You know, God hasn't called us to separate ourselves like the monk does from from society. You live among them. Uh, 1 Corinthians 5, Paul, you know, is encouraging them to put the man out that's claiming to be a brother and is involved in this wicked sin. But he says, I'm not telling you to not associate, you know, not not to eat and and associate with unbelievers because you'd have to be taken out of the world for that to happen. You live in a world and you're surrounded by unbelievers. You're surrounded by those are, that are without, those that are outside. And you should feel a sense of duty and responsibility towards them. 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse number 11. And that you study to be quiet and to do your own business and to work with your own hands as we commanded you, that ye may walk honestly toward who? Them that are without. Again, living in a way that has a con- that that uh, where you're conscious of the fact that I am surrounded by men that don't know my Lord. I am surrounded by those that are without, those that are outside of the church of Jesus Christ. I'm walking with a consciousness of them, with a sense of duty toward them, and that ye may have lack of nothing. Listen, you know what the world is used to in our day and age? They're used to freeloaders. They're used to a society that if they can take advantage of you, they will. And it's supposed to be okay. They ought to see something different among the church. They ought to see a people that are working hard and laboring that they might provide for themselves and that they might be able to give to others. Uh, A people that recognizes they have freely received and so they desire to freely give. What do you have that you didn't receive, the apostle wrote? A consciousness of that. We, Brother Gene read this uh, Wednesday night, and I was so excited because I was already kind of chewing on these thoughts. Matthew 5, this sense of duty and responsibility to those that are outside. And, and this chapter here wraps up with this very thought. In verse number 44, Christ says, listen, I don't want you to be like everybody else. You're supposed to be a holy nation. You're you're supposed to be a peculiar people. You're supposed to be a people that looks differently from everybody else. Verse 44, and and so to that end, he says, to that point, but I say unto you, love your who? Enemies. Enemies. 
Thus, that's those that are without. That's those that despise the word that we're preaching. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Now, if you don't have a sense of duty towards those individuals, then you say, well, what does it matter, right? But if there's a sense of responsibility like the soldier is called to towards those that are without, then this makes perfect sense. That ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven, because this is the way our Father behaves. If we want to look like him, this is how we behave, because this is how he behaves. For he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love them which love you, what reward have you? Do not even the publicans the same. If we only love the ones that believe and talk just like we do, how are we any different from anybody else, Right? I understand this whole hate speech thing has been blown out of proportion, right? In our time, we still have a responsibility to expose wrongdoing, and if it's wrong, call it wrong. But there's also a way in which we can do that that is honoring to God, that, it, that it, there can be a righteous indignation, there can be an anger and sin not, right? Be angry and sin not. There can still be gracious words. I want them to accuse me of having gracious words. Amen? Seasoned with salt as I speak the truth. If you just love the ones that are like you, you're no different than anybody else. The world is well versed in doing that. And if you salute your brethren only, what do ye more than others? Do not even the publicans so? Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. We're, we're running out of time. I see what I want to read here at the end. Let me just quote a verse to you, Hebrews 12, 14. You're going, to be, you're going to recognize it when I start talking. Follow peace with all men, it says. Follow, pursue peace with all men. And holiness, listen to this, listen to how important that is, without which no man shall see the Lord. Only those that strive in this manner are the ones that are going to see the Lord. Follow peace with all men in holiness. Blessed are the what makers? Peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers, the ones that return not evil for evil, but the ones that return good for evil. That, brothers and sisters, that's a calling for us to respond in a particular way to those that are without. To a, a relationship that we have with all men. A sense of duty and responsibility to all men. Uh, I will read this last verse. We got time for this. 1 Timothy 3. I want you to see this. I understand this is the this is the things that you should see in the uh, in, in the, the bishops, the elders, the pastors. I think those are all the same office. We've already been through that. I think those terms are used inter interchangeably in the New Testament. And he's setting forth the requirements. He said, if a man desires to be a bishop, if he wants to be a pastor, that's a good thing. He's desiring a good work. But he says, before the church lays their hands on such a man, you need to see a pattern of life that matches these things here. But why? Why should we see these things in this individual? Because this man is to be an example to the others that are there. And so when we're reading these qualifications, don't read it and go, well, this is just for the pastor. No, this is the way every Christian ought to behave, right? But the pastor ought to exemplify these things so that he's not leading the sheep astray. Like Paul said, follow me even as I follow Christ, right? There ought to be a pattern in, in the pastor that souls can follow. And so he's setting forth these standards. And listen to what one of the things is. Uh, one of the things, one is, yeah, that's right. One is, one of the things is that is set forth here regarding these qualifications of pastors in first timothy 3 and verse number 7 moreover he must have a good report of them which are without. without how about that huh how serious is it he says it ought to be evident in the life of the believer they have a good report even with those that are outside the church and if they've got anything bad to say about them it ought to be because they're doing the right thing right it, it, uh, what is it? Was it Peter that said something about that? Don't suffer. If you suffer, don't let it be for wrongdoing. Let it suffer for doing the right thing like Christ did. 
They ought to have a good report of those of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. God says this is a pattern that's worthy of following. We are, man, I want to read this verse. Can I read one more verse to you? 1 Corinthians 10. I totally overlooked this, and, I, and this is a great verse to close on, all right? L- look at what is included, what's part of our doing all things to the glory of God, all right? 1 Corinthians 10, and I won't have any time for comments, I'm sorry. But verse 31 through 33, let's read this. Whether therefore ye eat or drink, or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. And he's continuing on in this thought. Give none offense, neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God. Everyone, he says, even as I please, who? All All men. In all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many. Why? That they might be saved. The apostle had a sense of responsibility and duty to all men. And he's called us, the Lord has called us to have the same.